Welcome into this week's episode of Think Deeper, uh, brought to you by Focus Press. Once again, I'm your host, Jack Wilkie, joined, as always, by Joe Wilkie and Will Harob. Before we get to this week's episode, as we continue our Church Reset series, uh, as we've mentioned, we're doing this series based off a book I wrote a couple years ago, and we thought, why not give away a book or two? And so, on our Facebook page, which we're going to encourage you guys to all go like, if you haven't already, of course you have, the deep thinkers, that you're, you're following us on Facebook, right? <laughs> uh, it's Think Deeper Podcast, the page on Facebook. We're going to uh, post an image of the book. It'll, it'll say book giveaway. You can't miss it. Go to our Facebook page, like the page, like the post, comment and share the post uh, to be entered into the, the drawing. We will announce it on next week's episode. We will be giving away a copy. If I'm real generous, maybe two. Um, yeah, maybe two. I'm not going to say three. There's a lot three. of steps that they have to yeah. take. They have to like, like, comment, share. they got to be committed here. That's right. Well, you have to like, like us? Well, well <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, like, that's right. Well, I mean, again, remember, they've already liked the page, right? I mean, I can't right, imagine sure. anybody listening that yeah. hasn't already right. liked the Facebook page. I mean, and I'm sure maybe we're sending some people scrambling to their phones now so they don't want to be the one missing out, <laughs> right? But the question is, can I enter? Because I still need a copy. That's true. <laughs> that Joe still true. doesn't have a copy on his shelf. Yeah. Oh, we didn't, we didn't even put in the terms and conditions here you know usually it, you know it says employees or family members well i don't know maybe joe needs to enter you have to get on there and share it and, um if we draw people are gonna be really mad though if you win <laughs> that or some like bob smith that has zero friends has entered the contest yeah and like 30 and, times and, yeah yeah i was gonna say exactly and so has bob smith one and yeah. two and three and four. that would make for a real awkward podcast episode next week if we announced that joe's the winner <laughs> yeah, yeah that's what i'm saying yeah. bob, bob smith is the winner bob, bob smith. Uh, he wins both shares. copies yeah bob smith <laughs> one right. and bob smith 24 are our two winners next week joe stuffing the ballot box so uh, but no, uh, Joe is not going to win a book. He's going to have to buy one just like everybody else, except ah. the people that win. Uh, and so make sure to take advantage of that. Um, any other, anything else we need to get to before? All right, I guess I I'll just so. jump us into what we got for this week. So we're picking up our third Church Reset episode here. We did the first on consumer Christianity, on how the church really has become business-like, and instead of members, people are customers. You go to the one that you like, and the church is put on by leaders to try and attract those people that are going to like what they find in a church. We talked about the problems that that causes, and then we got into the Great Commission last time. That that's the first step, is, is to get back to really being the church. We've got to do what Jesus said, and, and really try to make people who are Jesus followers, make disciples, as, as the Great Commission says. But then what comes from that is, is now you, you're, you've started with a different place, so you're going to end up in a different place. You don't end up back at a consumer Christianity. You end up as a family. And as I put the book Church Reset out two years ago, this is the thing that excites people most. This is the thing that people love to talk about, that people desire, that people are starving for. And I think especially you know, over COVID shutdowns, being away from people and all that, you kind of, everyone realized the value of fellowship and togetherness and the need we have for each other, the love we have for each other. But in consumer Christianity, there's a hard cap on, on how close we can really get when we're very loosely bound by consumership, consumerism. And so... To be a, a church family, it's you've got a bunch of people who are imitating Jesus. Now we can share his love together. Now we can come together and, and every person is bringing... We talked about it in the first one. It's, it's Church isn't a restaurant where you come to be served. It's a potluck where you bring to serve other people. Well, when you have people doing that, coming to maturity in Christ and then bringing something to the table, we can share a love and a closeness together that you can't get under consumerism. Uh, it, it's just impossible to truly attain under that structure well I've, I've asked before because let's be honest you go to your average congregation today how many of them are going to go out there and say you know we we really don't act like a family nobody says that right everybody says you know it's great to have a church family you know it's great to have family you know we're we here at this congregation are a family but then you really look at, at the way again most congregations are set up under this consumeristic structure they don't act like family, even though they're they're kind of under this facade of being a family when they're not. You think about if your average family is 168 hours in a week, if you as a family spent 
three hours together for the entire week. And uh, let's be let's be liberal with it. Let's say five, seven hours with extra events, fellowship meals, etc. What kind of family do you know that that could survive and, and be close knit and be able to achieve things if they're spending five to seven, call it even ten hours out of a week together? You know, out of one hundred and sixty eight. It just that's that's not possible as a family to truly be close knit to truly again be able to achieve things to be able to to do the things that the body of Christ are supposed to do and let's be honest we've got a lot of people spending way less than ten hours it's closer to two it's closer to three hours out of their week that they're spending together and yet again we're still calling ourselves a quote unquote family it's this it's this facade of being a family that doesn't really exist those are friends not not family we use that term casually right you say oh, it's my work family. Or, you know, growing up, Joe and I, you know, we played hockey, and you see that, I mean, tournaments, every weekend you're around the same people, and people, we didn't use these terms, but other people would say, oh, it's our hockey family, and I think some people mean church family in the same sense of that, of your friends, the people you're, you're around but a lot. But it's that, separated from, yeah. from your other families, right. Right, yeah, and and so that, yeah, that it's less than your blood family, of course. You know, you might have your work family, but you're not spending Thanksgiving with them, right? Well... The Christian family supersedes your church. I mean, your 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 physical family, your blood family, right? Jesus said that if you know loving him, hating father and mother, and compared to your love for him, of if one comes in between one or the other, if you're forced to choose, these are the people you're going to spend eternity with. These are the people you have a higher level of connection with. That doesn't mean you're casting off your earthly family, uh, Lord willing, that you don't have to do that, but. It does mean there's a loyalty here that this isn't just people I like spending time around or people I see on Sunday, but people I'm really sharing my heart and soul and, and a spiritual journey with that is a connection you don't have with anybody else. You look at Ephesians 4 and you know what they talk about with what every joint supplies, right? Like we're all part of the family and every part plays a role here and... You know, that's part of the, the other part of the family is we don't, if you think about the, the family structure we have in the world, just with our, our, you know, actual physical family, a lot of people don't feel like they're a part of that. There's a lot of divorce that's rampant. There's a lot of kids that walk away and never hardly speak to their family again. So we don't get families right in general. Um, that's a good point. Ne- then you bring it into the church and it's like, no wonder why we don't get families right. And no wonder why we don't recognize that everybody plays a role and everybody is, is necessary. Because we don't hardly act that way in our actual family, so why would we bring that into the church? Well, and that's a good point because, once again, under this consumeristic mindset of the what's in it for me, you have a family where the parents, the kids are asking each other, hey, well, what's in it for me? You know, you know, what, 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 what do I get out of this? That family is, is not going to be operating at its fullest capacity. It's certainly not going to be a, the loving family that you know, a family should be where people are serving one another and trying to you know, do what's best for the entire family. If they're in it with a, again, calling back to last episode, um, or maybe, I'm sorry, two, two episodes ago with the well, what's in it for me mentality, the consumeristic mentality, that's why we have just the, again, this facade of family uh, that we see today. And if you take it to the fullest, like I think we talked about this maybe last week, but this idea that heaven is our ultimate goal, and when you push it out to the end, it's like a physical family who's just waiting for the parents to die off so that they can all cash in. We don't have to be particularly close. We are family. We all get the same goal. You know, we all get the same, the same. Um, you know, it's all in the will or whatever. And so it's basically that, and that's what we do as Christians is we're all kind of waiting to die. Yeah, we can be close to one another. That's great, but at the end of the day, really, it's just about getting to heaven. And if you can get it's to very heaven, great. individualistic, if I can get to heaven, great. right? And right. in yes, individualistic exactly. society, we're all very loosely connected. We're connected to the degree that it benefits us, and then when it doesn't anymore, we leave. Um, and, and, you know, we're just we're not loyal. We're you're here for a time. You're you're there for you just move on. At the first sight, even to as you said, marriage, divorce, uh, it's what am I getting out of this? And if I'm not getting that anymore, I quit. Whereas this is a thing that we're called to come together and die together. Um, that is a whole different level of it. And and in a family, may, not everyone has the same role. Again, that's what every joint supplies. But you know what? The little one, you're not going to expect them to make dinner for everybody, but they can set the table. The other kids, you know, the older kids, they can do the dishes afterwards. They can clean the table. They can do those things. Um, you know, maybe mom is making the dinner. Maybe dad is, is providing the dinner. Everyone's doing something as part of this. It's not the restaurant structure where you sit down and be fed. And so when you're bringing something, you feel valued as part of it. You realize I'm part of this family. 
and and I have something to contribute to this family, and everyone appreciates each other for what they bring to the table. And and it, you just can't do that when no one's expected to bring anything to the table. That doesn't happen at a restaurant, as we said, that you're not close with the other customers because they're just customers too. You're, you don't, you're not contributing anything to each other. Well, and part of this structure as well should be kind of more so of what we talked about last week, this idea of bringing disciples to maturity and then setting them, you know, out to go do the work, right? You know, if you have your, your five-year-old and, and you have them, you're training them up, hey, all right, you set the table. If all they're doing in 10 years is still just setting the table, you know, at 15 years old and they haven't grown at all, you're probably not doing something right. You know, if, if you're, if you're three-year-old and their job is to, is to put the silverware away, you know, when the, the dishwasher is being unloaded, maybe three is a little young. We'll stick with, we'll stick with five. Um, but again, in 15, in, in 10 years, they're 15 and that's still the only thing that they're doing to help the family. That's not great, right? Part of, of growing up in a family is okay. Your tasks are at this level at this age, and then they grow as you move on. Obviously with the church, that should be the structure, right? The idea of, of needing milk and then needing solid food. Uh, it's the idea of, hey, you don't get to just sit in a pew for 60 years, show up for two hours a week, and then go home and think that that's your Christianity. This idea of discipleship that we talked about last week is more so, this is this is where your Christianity starts at your, at your baptism, when you obey the gospel. These are the things that you learn. These are the things you start to do, and there should be growth. There should be progress. For 70% of most congregations, there's not a lot of growth. It, it, and if it's growth, it's very individualistic. Well, I'm going to grow my own Bible knowledge. Am I going to teach anybody? Nah, not really interested. Not not really for me. Am I going to serve anybody? Am I going to go visit? Am I going to go evangelize? Nah, not really. That's not for me. I'm going to grow my own individualistic Bible knowledge. That's about the extent of it. And I think there's a lot of leaders in the church that don't even have five-year-olds put in the silverware way. They don't expect anything. And studies have shown from a parental point of view Kids really need to have chores. They really need to feel like they can do something. They can provide something to the family. And I think I spoke on this last week where nobody knows their their spiritual gift. Nobody even knows how to serve the church. And so occasionally they'll, they'll show up and they think that's their way to serve. The leaders have to do a better job of helping people grow to maturity, helping people to disciple them along the way and say, this is a role for you. We need help here. Can you do this? And you let people grow into those things. Because it helps them feel apart the same way that a five-year-old, it really helps them feel like they're, I mean, my three-year-old gets the biggest kick out of helping me take the trash out, whatever it is, because it's his role. He thinks that, man, like the family would not operate the same without him, and he's right. It wouldn't, and he needs to know that from a very young age. How many Christians do you have show up to church that if they left today and never walked in the doors again, would they feel missed? Would they feel like, man, I, I've got to be there, like the church would not operate the like same Like a part of a family. Me. Exactly, like part of the family, but we don't do that. And I, we've we've talked about it's easy to to dunk on the people and be like, oh, how could you? It's the leaders that are not discipling them, that are not showing them all the things they could be doing. You're right. This is the connection between the two because we very much like to keep them separate. As we said last week, we wrongly view the Great Commission as a call to evangelism. It's that, but it's a lot more than that. It, it's that teaching them to observe all that I commanded you is bringing people to maturity in Christ, teaching them to love and to serve and to be a part of the church and the work of the church and all that. And so, but we think of, that's one thing, that's one work of the church is outreach, is, is that. And then over here, our, our love, our edification, you know, our, our fellowship, that's a, a different thing. And so we got a program for that and we got a program for this. And it's like, as we said last week, the Great Commission is a cycle that builds out a full church. That if you follow it, you bring people to maturity. And so, uh, I've, I've used this illustration. I don't think this even made it into the book, but I've, I've used it before. Of if the mission Jesus gave the church was to make raspberry cheesecakes. Let's just make that the example. You All right, go and make raspberry cheesecakes and teach people to make raspberry cheesecakes. Would the best way to do that be to get a bunch of people in a room on Sunday and be like, all right, we're going to go over this real quick in the next 20 minutes. Here's how you make a raspberry cheesecake. Boom. You know, on a cooking show that you watch those things. Okay, here's how you make it. Okay, well, I've watched a lot of the, you know, like Food Network stuff, you know, growing up. My sisters watched that. You know, my wife watches that. I watch it and I go, we can't make one that looks like that. Hmm. Mine doesn't really look like theirs. I'm not very good at this. I'll just go buy one from them, right? If that was the mission of the church, what would be the best way to do it? To sit everyone down and say, okay, here's how it's done. You guys go go give that a try and then hope that they do it? Or would it be to make disciples that make raspberry cheesecake of 
get somebody, invite them over to your house, say, here's how you do it. Now you make one. You go make one for someone else. Okay, now that you know how to do it, you can teach somebody else how to do it. And then you can contribute. You can be part of this as well. And and now you've got a bunch of people who can do these things. So you have the Great Commission. It's not make raspberry cheesecakes. It's make disciples. Well, we get everyone in a room and we try and teach them some things and say, go home and do this on your own. And, and that's it. Whereas if you get everyone together and, and you, again, individually or in, in small groups of people have this time to say, here's how you do this. Here's how it's done. Now you go do it and pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. Now you've got a family, not of consumers, but of everyone contributing their part. And so we can't separate the Great Commission from the family church we want to be. Everyone wants the family church. The Great Commission is the hard work that gets us there. Full disclosure, I'm going to be transparent here with our deep thinkers, our podcast listeners. So, Jack, we have an outline that we're working off of, and Jack had this just one line. It said, the raspberry cheesecake illustration. <laughs> and um, I asked him about it before we started recording, and he said, you know what? I'm just going to just gonna let you hear about it on the episode. So that was the first time I've heard it, too. Um, but, Jack, that's a great analogy because you think about it, some of the best cooks that you know, maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your, it's your grandmother, Maybe it's 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 your aunt, whoever it is. Did they become a great cook by watching YouTube or by watching, as you said, a cooking show? No, they didn't. More than likely, they became a great cook because somebody took the time to show them, okay, this is how you do it. This is the, the trial and error, right? The very hands-on. A lot of people are big fans of of hands-on learning. And so, Jack, the, the point the point is brilliant in the sense that you think about Titus 2. What are the older Christians commanded to do, as we as we've discussed before? Take and mentor younger Christians, right? Show them the ropes, teach them, show them how to love their husbands, how to be discreet, chase homemakers, all, all these things. It, it's so much, the, the the picture in the New Testament, it just doesn't look like the, like you're saying, let's sit them down for 20 minutes, give them a sermon that they're probably 20% paying attention to, you know, tuning in for five or six minutes of it and then tuning out. And then we expect that to be discipleship as opposed to hands-on, you know, again, inviting people into your house, teaching them, showing them, okay, this is how you do it. Go give it a try. Now let's let's work on you know talk about maybe some of the things that didn't work. The it's it's exactly like your favorite cook that didn't learn because they just watched a TV show, but because somebody showed them and helped them through the, the trial and error side of things. And this illustration can also it, it can just be expanded so much um, because I was also thinking about if you were to set people loose, right? Go make these cheesecakes during the week. How many people would come back on Sunday and be like? You know, here's this beautiful cheesecake. Does yours look like uh, uh, pretty much, pretty much, right? We put on this good face that we look like really good Christians, but during the week we're floundering, we really struggle, but we can't let everybody know that my cheesecake is horrible. My cheesecake looks nothing like what it ought to look like, but we're really embarrassed by the fact that our cheesecake is just sinking on the inside. It tastes bad and it's just not good. But how do you go and tell somebody who's who's literally giving you, you know, you got the, the paid preacher, like he's... He's this gorgeous cheesecake. They could sell a cheesecake factory, right? And mine doesn't really look like that. And so I'll just pay attention to him. Um, he's clearly got it going on. I'll try to emulate that. And we're floundering. It's horrible. But who's going to say anything about it, right? And and so, yeah, from that point, I think the – and I had heard that illustration years ago. I forgot that I, I completely spaced. You'd asked before if I heard it. I'm like – that's not ringing a bell. And then as soon as you said, oh, yeah, okay, that rings a bell. Jack, was um, was that illustration get, in the book? Because Joe hasn't read it, so I don't know if that would have That's true. Helped. Yeah, Joe doesn't even have a copy. <laughs> it was not in the book, and um, I only know that because I think I think Jack told me, not because I read No, well, I think um, I said that like two minutes ago, so. <laughs> yeah, there you gotcha. go. There you go, exactly. That's but, the only way that I know it wasn't so in the book. The thing about this is it it's to bring people to maturity so they can go about doing the work. And so you might be a Christian who's like, I've been a Christian for a long time. I want to do the work. I've never really been taught what to do and to build this family and to encourage and to build up my, my church and to, to bring something to the meal, right? So what do I do? The one another commandments are, are where we're going to start. The one another commandments outline how you have this. And the problem is in consumer Christianity, we try to f check this box. We've talked about that before through programs. All right, you're supposed to fellowship. Here's a, a small group, or here's a potluck we're going to have. You're supposed to, you know, confess and, like, get to know each other and encourage each other, so it's a small group. We'll get, you know, five or six families together, you know, every now and then, and, and that's how it's going to be done. The cheesecake-making thing is so that you can go and do this on your own, as, as Joe said. So we'll have Christians that make visits and, you know, to shut-ins or, or phone calls or, or send them things, do nice things for them. 
without a program. We'll have Christians that study and, and invite other Christians over to talk Bible and to pray on their own without needing somebody to put it on the church calendar for them. We'll have a Christian that will evangelize outside of a door-knocking day, that, that you're going to do these things uh, as a result of, hey, you know what, I know how to make cheesecakes, so I'm going to go make the cheesecakes. I know how to do the work of, of Christ. I've come to maturity, so I'm going to take this on my own. And so let's work our way through the one another's here. Uh, I think one of the, the key ones, the, the biggest one is love one another, and we're going to get to that and, and really how much deeper that goes than, than we sometimes ponder on. Uh, but we're going to save that one for last because that's the big one, right? It, it, it drives the rest of these. Let's start at the top with another big one. Encourage one another day after day. And this is a pairing that you have in Hebrews 3, 12 through 14, where he was talking about the Israelites lost their faith in the wilderness and didn't get to go. You know, those the, that generation died in the wilderness because they didn't have faith. And so he says, encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that no one is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And then he comes back around at the at the end of his uh, preaching in Hebrews when he's starting to make application in, in Hebrews 10 uh, to have that same thing of uh, consider one another, how to stimulate one another, how to stir each other up to love and good works, right? And so, uh, you know, you go back to Cain and Abel and that question from Cain, am I my brother's keeper? God's telling you, you are your brother's keeper. You need to look at your fellow Christians and think, how can I build them up? How can I... You know, number one, encourage them not to be deceived by sin. And number two, it push them on toward greater works. And so encourage one another. Take that on yourself to look around the room on Sunday. Look for people, especially if you're an older Christian that's been around for a while. Look to somebody you can mentor. Look to that young mom. If you're, as Will just brought up, if you're an older Christian woman who has, has been around and has been a Christian for decades... Ask that younger mom, how can I help you out? Let's get together and, and pray and talk Bible or, or just, you know, have a cup of coffee together. How can I encourage you, the older men to the younger men? If, if you've been a Christian, this is the work that you've got to start taking on. I'm glad you mentioned Hebrews 10, uh, that you added that one as well, because the 313, I think, is they encourage one another daily. That's really easy to do, I feel like. It, it may not be done all the time, but it's easier to do. It's this next part of, you know, 1024, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. That's driving us to be better, as you talked about. That's really tough to do. You know, checking in, saying, hey, brother, how are you? I uh, hope your week's going well, praying for you. That's really encouraging. That's fantastic. We need to do it. Taking somebody along and saying, hey, man, how's your prayer life? Did you go visit so-and-so this week? Or, um, you know, where are you at in your Bible study? Have you studied this passage? Let's study this together. Uh, how can we go and encourage brother so-and-so? He hasn't been at church the last couple of weeks. We need to go visit him. Can you go with me? That's spurring one another on to love and good deeds. And that's a lot more difficult to do. But it is vital nonetheless. Like, it, it's, you know, we, we don't want to just put it as sending out a text or praying for somebody. Yes, that are you spurring one another on to be better as Christians, to to love one another more, to have more good deeds? And we know from Ephesians 2.10, though I, I hate going outside the book and it's not connected, but Ephesians 2.10 of the good deeds that God puts in our path to walk in, he gives us opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Are we helping each other see those good deeds that we can walk in them, that God's placing in our path? Are we, are we helping each other stay on that path to walk in them? Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought the Hebrews 10 portion into this because I think that's just as vital as the, hey, hey, brother, I'm praying for you. We want to make it applicable, if that makes sense. Well, and, okay, so 1025, everyone's, oh, not forsaking the assembly, not forsaking the assembly. It doesn't say that. It's building on what we just mentioned in 23 and 24 of considering one another, how to build, you know, stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And he says, not forsaking our own assembling together. He's not talking about Sunday morning. He's talking about the habit of coming together, something we do beyond just Sunday morning, but a habit of being in each other's lives as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so we say forsake the assembly. We mean Sunday morning. And if you were there on Sunday morning, you didn't forsake the assembly. Right. Number one, don't forsake the assembling. Don't be out of the habit of getting together with your Christian brothers and sisters. Remember Hebrews 3 said day after day, not every Sunday, day after day, regularly doing this in each other's lives. And number two, it's not just being in each other's physical presence, it's being in each other's physical presence for the purpose of encouraging and driving each other to good works. And so saying, I got in the same room with all these people on Sunday, therefore I can check the box of not forsaking the assembly, totally misses the point here. 
of encouraging one another, stimulating one another to love and good works, regularly doing it day after day, being involved in this kind of encouragement of one another. I want to get to one that, that kind of ties directly into this, and that is the idea of bearing one another's burdens, taken obviously from Galatians um, 6. I'll read 1 and 2 very quickly. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And, and to me, this is one of their, or it should be one of the greatest blessings of being a part of the church. But at the same time, while being one of the greatest blessings, it's also one of the things that we take the least advantage of here in 21st century consumeristic Christianity. Uh, the other the other place you could go, James 5, 16, confess your trespasses to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. It's this idea that when your life is, is is difficult, when things are not going well, when you've had a really, really tough month, when you've had a really, really tough couple of months, when, when you are just, you know, when life gets you down, when you're going through some anxiety, depression, whatever it is, the church, which should be the family, you know, the body of Christ, should be there for you as a family to help bear your burden, right? To, to be there for you, to, to let you vent if need be, to, to bring you food, to, to, to care for you like a family should. The problem is we in the church don't really like to share our burdens. We don't really like to let anybody else know that that our, as Joe said earlier, that our cheesecake is not as good as somebody else's. You know, we want to put on, once again, this, this, this facade of my life is great. Somebody else said it, not me. It's not original to me. The greatest lie or the biggest lie in the church today is when you're walking down the hallway and somebody says, hey, how you doing? And everybody says those two words, right? I'm fine. I'm doing fine. You know, doing, doing great. We don't share, we, and so it's impossible for, for me to bear Joe's burden if Joe never shares his burden, and yet this is a direct command that we see multiple times again in James, confess your trespasses to one another, and the problem once again with it is if we're not sharing our burdens, how do we expect each other to bear it? Joe, you are, you're a therapist, and you're a big believer in communication, that, that to solve problems, communication is one of the biggest things, and I, and I agree with you. Let's say you had a family that never communicated about anything. Maybe there's some families out there that are like that. Whenever they had it, whenever one part of that family had an issue or had something going on, they just bottled it up. Never talked about it. Uh, never shared it with with the rest of their family. They just everybody bottled up their own issues. How would that family function? What would be the end result of that? Bitterness would get yeah, it'd, it'd be awful. And but yet that's the way we do it in the church. We bottle up everything. We don't share. To some, you know, some people do. And if we do, it's very vague. It's very minor. It's very ambiguous. And yet, and so that that's the the result of this. And it, again, it's one of the least taken advantage of blessings of the church today. It is. I've I've said before that confession of sins is a superpower that we just don't use. Uh, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But you think about in this consumeristic structure, when and where are we actually given the opportunity to do this? If anyone has need, come forward as we stand and sing. And as we've said before, nobody's walking down in front of, in some cases, hundreds of people to say, hey, I'm really struggling with this one big thing in my life. Because number one, it's embarrassing. But number two, how are you going to get help from that? You just confessed it to hundreds of people. And if it's a hundred people's problems, it's nobody's problem. And so... What is the structure that we have? Well, unless we have this family-like closeness, this day-after-day -day encouraging each other, this being in each other's spiritual lives, and, you know, Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, had the best take on this that I've ever seen, and I, I included some of it in Church Reset, but it's in his book Life Together, which is well worth the read. It's a short read. Go check it out. Um, but he talked about how Christians have fellowship as good people, but what really drives heart and soul fellowship is as weak, needy people as people who are all dependent on God, as people who are not perfect, as people who, as Will says, if, if we're all saying, I'm good, I'm good, you know, I'm, you're good, I'm good, all right, we're good, There, there's a barrier there that's going to keep us from getting closer. And so when I say it's a superpower, it's casting off our self-dependence, casting off our self-reliance, our, our determination to look good in front of others, and just, you know, not always being the wallowing, needy person, but being able, having those people in your life that when you are struggling, that you can turn to and say, need you to carry me right here. I need some prayers. I need some accountability. I need just some encouragement. I need whatever else. And and they can do that. You can be that for somebody else. That's where a real closeness comes. That's I've said before, I wrote on this before, there's three levels of fellowship. There's fellowship of, hey man, great weather outside today. Hey, I, I, you know, did you see the game yesterday? Just 
connecting with somebody else, right? Conversation, whatever. That's fine. There's spiritual fellowship, which is we get together and we talk about the Bible together. All right, hey, did you see what Jesus said here in John 13 and, uh, you know, such and such? That's great. The real key and what we're getting at with this Christian family is personal spiritual fellowship. That's the uncomfortable one. That's the one where it's, how is your walk going? How are you and God doing? How can I help encourage you in your walk? Is there a burden that I can bear for you? Is there a sin? You know, hey, I've got this sin that I'm struggling with and I need prayers for. Or, you know what, I've just got this, this thing that's really holding me back in my walk with God. Please pray for me or maybe check up on me. And, you know, give me advice on this. How would I handle that? Personal spiritual fellowship. And you think about how much of that do we really have? And, and how much does a consumeristic structure even create the possibility of that? Unless you go out there and, and pursue it with somebody, you're not going to have it. That's unfortunate because it's so important and powerful in our walk with God is, is to have really be open and know each other in that way. And as you said, the invitation, it's a personal pet peeve of mine. It's the mourner's bench, you know, 1800. Look, up the, look it up. It is an emotional plea. But you think about this. First off, there's nothing personal about that. Not one personal thing. I didn't tell you my burdens. I told everybody my burdens. Second off, how shame-based is that? (gasps) He did what? And then we always say, brother, I'll pray for you. But really, it's a very shame-based thing. And we're hoping that we will shame ourselves out of sin, in my opinion. And it's not a love for God, a love for one another. I need help in this. And, And I'm glad that you did this well on the back end. As you talked about the second part, how do we encourage one another daily when we don't act like we need encouragement? How do we carry one of, carry one another's burdens if we never confess our burdens? So we have a group where, due to shame, we don't want to share those sins because everybody else is perfect and I'm not. And so the shame keeps us in that and then we're forced to act perfect. We're forced to act like everything is fine, lest we feel shame. And when we do that, then what's the point of encouraging you? We don't really need to. So, so much of Christianity, I feel like, and this is where a lot of people in the world have turned away, is it is very shame-based. That's not what this is about in sharing one another's burdens. It's saying, I'm weak and I need your help. And the other brother goes, you know what? Christ, we're, we have this in Christ. He's His grace is sufficient, right? And so we're going to get through this. I'll walk alongside you. I'll help you. That's love. That's unconditional love. That was the deepest, greatest need that God created in us. The church is the perfect institution to fulfill that unless we're cheapening it by doing things like offering the invitation and saying, well, that's good. Once so again, we taking personal. the shortcut route. Right. Exactly. We, we always want to make it fastest. We want to go as quick as possible through this. I want to transition, though, to the next one because this also connects, is the tolerate one another. And we see this at the beginning of Ephesians uh, chapter 4, I think in the first three verses here. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Showing tolerance for one another in love. Sometimes somebody is going to sin, they're going to frustrate you, they're going to share a burden or whatever, and it's going to be really difficult. That's when we have to recognize that the bond of, of the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is so important. To maintain, and part of that's going to be going above and beyond in tolerating one another, even when they really frustrate us, even when they take us off, even when they're ultra needy and we're frustrated with them. Tolerate one another because unity is that important. Unity in the spirit, right after this, he's going to get into one body, one spirit, uh, called in one hope. You're calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, the seven ones that are really creating this sense of unity in the church. And that is built upon people who are willing to tolerate one another in love, in humility, with gentleness, with patience. We don't do that much either. We get frustrated at one another. We sit on opposite ends of the church. Maybe we can worship together, and if it gets bad enough, we just church hop and go down the road. There's no tolerance for one another, from what I can see. Um, and and so we're that also goes along, though, at the end of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, where it says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. This is how we walk in a manner worthy. As he starts in chapter 4, the book ends of the chapters, though I don't necessarily like the chapter breaks, I think it's interesting here that the book ends are both about encouraging or, or tolerating one another, forgiving each other, putting up with one another, in all love, being kind to one another, tenderhearted. It's how we do those things. Is it easy to forgive? No. Is it easy to tolerate? No. But if we're humble about it, if we're patient, if we're gentle, if we're kind-hearted, if we're tender-hearted, um, 
these things become more more possible. And what is the end of it? Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You need it just as much. Christ put up with you at your worst. Are you willing to put up with one another? But this so, is also a really tough one. And Bonhoeffer, again, he has this brilliant section about the dr- the wish dream church, that everyone has this wish dream, and their pursuit of that leads them to never really realize what the church is supposed to be here. And I, I've, I've run into people like this over the course of Church Reset of that they're constantly looking somewhere else. They're not ever really settling with a church because no church is good enough. Newsflash, there won't be one that's good enough. Look, Flip through the entire New Testament, all of these churches that we're given a glimpse into, the seven churches of Asia and Revelation, all the letters that Paul wrote, you know, Peter... All of these churches had problems. We always talk about restoring the first century church. They all had problems. The church in Acts had problems. I mean, it, it, you're not going to find a place that doesn't have problems because, you know, as it said, if you ever find the perfect church, you can't become a member because then you would, you know, you'd bring it down, right? And so we can't find this perfect thing and people that are always in pursuit of it. And, and that's the beauty of these verses that say, tolerate one another in love, uh, forgive each other, be tenderhearted towards each other, bearing with one another, patient with each other. Um, Philippians talks about this, of having the same mind as one another and, and really realizing I'm going to have to put up with some stuff if I'm going to be in, in a family. Because it's the same with your physical family. You love your physical family. Every person, your your siblings, your children, your your wife, your husband, they drive you nuts sometimes. There's things that you just got to overlook, things that you got to put up with and be okay with, and that's okay. Because if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to have anybody around. And so when we talk about all this church stuff and everyone gets so excited about being a family, and then you start working on it, and then there's a clash. There's a, a not seeing eye to eye. There's I want it this way and you want it that way and what are we going to do? Or there's a we just disagree on this thing. If you can't do this one, it's always going to end right there. It's always going to be a dead end. So, uh, number one, stop having a utopian vision. There's not going to be a church where nobody ever disagrees because if there's two people in a church building, there's going to be a disagreement at some point along the way. So, don't have the utopian view, number one. Number two have the attitude that has the uh, the willingness that says I'm going to have to give I- I'm going to have to be forgiven and I'm going to have to do some forgiving. I'm going to have to tolerate and I'm going to have to be tolerated and that's okay. That's part of this. Is that the idea of submitting to one another that you see later in Ephesians Absolutely. in chapter 5? You know, part of being filled with the spirit is submitting to one another. And you know, this one steps on my toes probably more than any of the other ones um just because as with any you know, large group of people, there are going to be people that you, not even necessarily that you just disagree with, that you just maybe don't get along with that well, that maybe there's, there's certain things about their personality that you just clash with, or you just don't maybe really enjoy being around them. And as we keep going back to the analogy of a physical family, if there's something about somebody in your immediate family that you don't like, do you just put them out on the side of the road and say, all right, you're no longer a part of the family? No, of course not. You don't get to do that. They're still a part of the family. You have to learn to, the New King James has it back in Ephesians 4, bearing with one another in love. And again, it's this whole idea of, of always understanding we're on the same team. You know, we're all trying to to reach a common goal. And, and yes, it is heaven, but it's also trying to help each other in our Christian walk. And again, this is arguably one of the hardest because you're having to lower yourself. You're having to submit. And as we talked about in three or four episodes ago, we as humans don't really like to submit. uh, So that's something that's hard for us to do. But again, very, very difficult one. But we have to understand if we truly want to operate as a family, the way that God designed the church to, we have to bear with one another. We're not always going to get along 100% of the time. We're not always going to be best friends with each other. Got to bear with one another in love. There is a time to break fellowship with somebody, right? I mean, we acknowledge that, but the difference is the time is when they won't submit to God, not when they won't submit to me. And that shows the arrogance and the pride of refusing to tolerate or forgive is you're setting yourself up as the arbiter of fellowship, you know, that it's all up to me, that I, like, if they violate me, if they get on my wrong side, then, I, you know, I'll, I'll cut them off. I'll take my right. ball and go home. I'll, that's not okay. And, and as Joe brought up, it ends with, as God in Christ has forgiven you, he goes into chapter five, be imitators of God, walk in love, just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for us. And so it just continues that theme of you've been loved, you've been forgiven, do that to each other. And if you can't do that, 
you got a big problem. You are the problem in the church if you can't do that. And so tolerate one another in love. But all of this is about love. And so that gets us to, as I said, um, oh, no, we're not, we're not to the final one yet. I've, I'm skipping over one here. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. This is another one of those superpower things that gets neglected. Be hospitable to one another is be in each other's lives, in each other's homes, at each other's kitchen tables, in each other's living rooms, because that's where those personal spiritual fellowship conversations can happen. They're not going to happen in a Bible class. They're not going to happen in a worship service because that's a listening opportunity. But for people to open up about their lives and talk and share, that happens in a comfortable place in your home. And, and so building that kind of relationship that you have to have, it, it is it is literally indispensable. And as we saw with COVID, like just being in proximity to each other is not the same as being close with each other. Well, I was going to say, it's also... The time is also not the 15 minutes after the worship service before you hit the black IP. Like, all right, brother, you know, have a good day. Like, we think that that's the fellowship after church, and there is really good fellowship. I, I think it's great. I love that my church at Jackson Temple, we stand around, we talk for 20, 30 minutes after. Um, that's fantastic. I love it. It's one of the best parts of Sunday is we worship God, we're together. That's fantastic. But you know what? The when, when we moved there, one of the coolest things, we had an opportunity to have some of the members over. We did Tuesday night fellowship meals and had a lot of them in our house just to kind of get to know people. And it was the best time. Were we always discussing scripture? No. Was Did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, we're, we're talking about the area. We're learning about Tennessee. They're telling us about their personal histories and how they got together as a couple or whatever. It was so great. And we're, we're talking about maybe reinstituting or going back to it. We, we got away from it for a bit. But um, it's exciting to have people over. And let me just say this. A lot of people get intimidated by the hospitality. Well, I just, I can't cook for a lot of people. I can't do it. Man, make PB&Js. It is not about you putting on the greatest meal or your house being absolutely immaculate when people walk in. It's about having them over. Obviously, don't have like the Cheetos, you know, all over the carpet and whatnot. Like, well, yeah, we want to we wanna present well or whatever, but I think people really psych themselves out of this command by thinking everything has to be perfect. The point is get people in your home and get to know them. If you have to have PB and J's, go for it. And families aren't perfect. Again, that's that's the point here. When you know, do you clean your house immaculately every time your family's in the house? Of course not. You'd never have a dirty house. We don't we don't appropriately view our brothers and sisters as our family, and so that's why, again, to Joe's point. Uh, the house isn't very clean. I'm not the best cook. And so this to me might be the most ignored one out of all of them because what we see now, and, and obviously this isn't the worst option in the world, but be hospitable to one another means go out to eat with them. Again, if yeah, that's have all you right, which that's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong, but we have truly lost the art of bringing people into our homes because that's where you're the most personal, right? That's where in many cases, people are the most vulnerable when they feel like these, these people have genuinely welcomed me into their home to share these things, to talk about these things. We've lost that art in many congregations. This is a visual representation of the thing we talked about earlier. How are you? I'm good. And, and always looking shiny in front of each other and putting our masks on. Right. If the only time you're going to have a fellow Christian into your house is when everything is just immaculately clean, everything just sparkles, you're doing the exact same thing. You're, you're doing the physical manifestation of, I'm perfect. My life does not have any flaws. And I, you know, a member of a church I, I preached for a while back said, you know, I know I'm supposed to have people over, but it's just so hard to get my house clean. And, and so I just don't, and like, that's the problem. If you're waiting until your life is perfect to have somebody over so they can see your perfect life, don't worry about them seeing your perfect life. It's okay if they come over and there's dishes on the sink or on the counter, you know, in the sink on the counter. If there's, you know, things, as you said, if it's if it's not a five-star meal, okay. It Keep it simple. You know, I, I love this idea that uh, Will's dad, Brad, posted a while back, years ago, actually. Okay? It's hard to have people over. And, in fact, in this day and age, this is a really good idea because of inflation. It's really expensive to feed two families or to feed, you know, have a group of people over. Um, he said, make a meal in the crock pot. Pick it up, go over to the other person's house, bring your own. We got our meal, you got yours, let's sit down and just eat together. Like, find a way is really the thing. Is it so important to spend the time together that let's get the barriers out of the way. And and it's the difference between entertaining and hospitality. Entertaining is, let me show you this incredible meal I can make, how immaculate my family is, how cleaned up my kids are, all of that stuff. Man, We've had people over in our house with dishes all over the counter, with our kids, with their hair all over the place, you know, like just not combed and all that, just looking like a mess, with 
and you know eating sandwiches with them but boy we had good fellowship we we got closer together with each other and we weren't pretending that we were perfect that's the problem with this approach is saying i've got to it's that same thing i got to make sure people think that i'm perfect stop that get out of that habit have get in the habit of having people over when you got a little bit of a mess the praying for one another the encouragement the confessing sins to one another those are all easier to do in the comfort of somebody's home when you're feeling very welcomed. You're, and, and Will, you correctly pointed out the vulnerability. You're feeling a closeness to this person. Some of the best prayer times that I've ever had in my life, a group prayer times, is sitting around a kitchen table. We say, brother, you're going through something. Let me let me pray. Let, let's pray. And we all take time to pray. We're not doing that at the building. Yeah, yeah occasionally. Very, very, very rarely. We do that in each other's homes. And the power that comes from that... The, the feeling that you get walking out of that person's home or they go home, man, you're on a spiritual high. And we talk about like, man, I'd love to get back to the spiritual high, but we don't do anything that creates a spiritual high. And I understand there's valleys as well. We don't, we're not always going to be on the high. At the same time, what we see in Acts 2 of those, those people breaking bread together, sharing meals, being in each other's house, devoted to the apostles' teaching, that is what creates people that are willing to be radical in their faith, that two chapters later are giving up their own property for one another. That's the emotion, the love, the connection that is created is when you're together. So I think the the hospitable, and don't forget the last part, without grumbling. Man, it's really easy to, and this is 1 Peter 4, 9 for those that, that want to know. Um, it's really easy to have people over, but then to be grumbling about, oh, they didn't take their shoes off, they didn't do this, oh, they ate so much, you know, whatever it is, on the back end of things, be grumbling before, I can't believe they're wanting to come over at 5.30, or they just showed up at the door, and, and they didn't even call ahead of time, no, 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 without grumbling, we are, man, it's always a pleasure to have you, you want to come over at 2 a.m. because you got something on your mind, you come over, because we're going to invite you in, we're going to pray for you, we're going to be there for you, that's without grumbling. And one last thing, and then I'll let Jack get into the, the last one we have, love one another, People read Acts 2, the end of it, and talk about they had all things in common. They were continuing steadfastly in, in fellowship, breaking of bread. People want this. You know, again, they read Acts 2 and they're like, man, that sounds really great. This idea of being a close knit family. We hear lessons about it. We hear sermons about it. Again, it's it's this whole idea really behind church reset of, hey, shouldn't shouldn't church be more? People want this. They just don't know how to go about achieving it. They don't know how to go about getting it because you take a younger, uh, younger, younger uh, couple who, you know, they they want this, you know, more than anything. If they don't have older people that have invited them over and shown them, okay, this is, you know, you you well, come into come into our home. They don't have the example set for them. Maybe they're going to to be less inclined to do that themselves. But if you're younger, you're older. No matter if nobody else is doing this at your congregation, you got to start somewhere. And so if you truly want this culture, you truly want this atmosphere in your congregation of what we're talking about, and not what we're talking about, what God's Word is talking about, you got to maybe start with it being uncomfortable. Sure, the first time you invite somebody over might be a little awkward, right? you got to think up conversation starters, whatever it is. But the more you do this, again, read Acts 2, read Acts 4. This is what made the New Testament church, the first century church, so special. And again, deep down, people understand now when we read that, that's what made it so special, and that's what we want. We just have to figure out how do we go about doing it. There's a number of games on Amazon, um, things like that, just for practical. For those that are really afraid, of, what would we talk about? Uh, there's plenty of conversation starters. Just look that up on Amazon. You, you can get them you for don't pretty even cheap. Buy it off Amazon. Just Google no. conversation prompts. That's you know, true. I, I've done just that before. Think about, yeah, what are interesting questions? What would I want to know about this person? What would I be? What do I want them to know about me? We had a, a fellowship time with with church recently where we were broken into. Uh, you know, groups of four or five men, four or five women, and I just passed out questions because I, I looked around the room and I realized I, I just don't know some of these things about you guys. How did you become a Christian? How did you end up here in this town? You know, what brought you here? What did you do with your career if you're retired or what do you do now? Um, you know, and some of those things you know about people, so ask the next question. And and you get to know each other and you tell each other stories and, and there's a closeness that grows from that. And so, yeah, just find a way. Um, the final one is, is what draws all this together is love one another and everyone knows that that's a Christian commandment. That's something that Jesus commands, love one another. And so we say that, love one another, love God, love others. Yeah, love one another is good, but it goes farther than that. And then we go to love your, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a, you know, the uh, uh, second great command, right? 
it's a great command. It's a wonderful commandment. It, it, it's a thing to look at and say, how would I treat myself? How do I look out for myself, care for myself? I should care for others that way. That's not what Jesus commanded Christians. That's what we're, that's the outward love we're supposed to have for all people. But among Christians, he reserved a higher love. He told his disciples after washing their feet, and in that section, John 13 through 15, and, and a, a, that kind of that Last Supper discourse, he said, love one another as I have loved you. That's he, right in the sense of he's saying, greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. He says, I'm going to die for you. I want you guys to love each other to that level. Now, you look around at your church family on Sunday, and you might say, I love them. You might say, I love my neighbor as myself, but would I die for these people? Would I, and and it's one of those, I've said this so many times, faithful in little, faithful in much. You can say, oh, I would die for them. Okay, but how are you living for them? How are you sacrificing for them today? How are you loving them today? And if it's passing them in the hallway on Sunday saying, how are you doing good? How are you doing good? It's very hard to say we love on that level. And so it really challenges us. And you say, well, how do I manifest the love for them that way? Have them in your home. Encourage them. Confess your sins. Bear their burdens. All these things that we just talked about. Tolerate them. You know, that's loving as as Jesus loved. That's loving and getting yourself out of the way and loving people better than yourself. Philippians 2 says this of, um, you know, considering one another above yourself. Romans 12 has the same thing of of deferring and putting other people first, not just loving them as yourself, but loving them better than yourself. Boy, that's a challenge. That is way deeper than just love one another. And again, that is a love that is reserved for the church. That's a command. He only gave the one another there is not everybody. It's the church. Love one another as I have loved you. And that's when he comes around and says, the world is going to know you're my disciples by your love for one another. The fact that you will die for each other, sacrifice for each other. In, in uh, Acts, you see people selling their property and giving to one another and all the things they did for one another, risking for one another, sacrificing for one another. That's what shows the world. And the world doesn't get that love. We can offer the world love, but we're not going to give them that. This is a privilege for the people of God. But if we're not giving it to each other, then we don't have that witness to the world. And are we... I, I think about... You, you really struck a nerve there, Jack, when you talked about how are we living for one another. It's one of the saddest things. Are we willing to give up maybe some of the things that we have going on during the week to get together? Well, hospitality is really important, you know, love to, love to get there. Are you willing to say, you know, that, that Tuesday meeting that I usually do with X, Y, or Z or, or those sports that I play or whatever else, I'm going to set those aside for now because it's actually more important to be around one another, to, to love one another, to take these times together. Um, that's part of the love. It's a sacrificial love. It's a humble love. It's a, it's a love that's willing to say, me getting together with them, me being there for my brothers and sisters is more important than anything. So it's great to talk about it on Sunday. It's great to talk about it on the podcast. Are we willing to actually have it be a sacrificial love? And that's the key with all of this is the sacrifices that it's going to take. Because again, with everybody looking at this saying, man, this is great. I, I really want this. It's going to take you giving up some things. You know, uh, we, we have the same amount of hours in a week that Jesus had. We have the same amount, amount of hours in a week that, you know, that, that your next door neighbor has. The only difference is how are you going to spend those hours? And so, you know, with the busyness of our schedules, a lot of times our hours are used up. Right. You know, with with this sport that our kids are playing or with this event that we've got going on or with this concert we want to go to or this, that and the other thing to truly dedicate your time to this endeavor of actually trying to be a family, trying to love one another, trying to be hospitable to one another. You're going to have to devote time to it. And again, that's going to be a sacrifice for some people. It's going to mean giving up maybe some some certain comforts again. Maybe it's uncomfortable for you to have people in your home. Maybe it's uncomfortable for you to talk to somebody you don't know very well. It's going to it's going to take you being willing to get over those those things that may be obstacles right now, those things that are barriers, those things that you're going to have to again be uncomfortable for a little bit of time. But those are some of the sacrifices that all of this is going to take. Again, a lot of Christians look at this and say, "Man, I really want this." The question they have to ask is, "Are they going to be willing to to make these sacrifices, to give up these things, to to maybe provide a little bit more time during the week for these things, to set aside one night a week?" And say, I'm going to have a, a, a family over from church one night a week, you know, three nights a month, whatever it is, but start somewhere, I guess is the, is the point that, that I'm trying to make here. Start somewhere. If you're not doing anything, one night a week is, is better than nothing. Absolutely. Uh, the sacrifice, it's just not going to happen without that. Uh, it's not going to happen if you can't make time. 
If and and as far as loving your church family above the way you love the world, and we've got Christians who have a pull from their family who aren't Christians. One of the best ways you can show that family is, you know what, you guys actually come behind the church. I love you very much. You know, I'm not trying to insult you or anything else, but if if I like if I need to be there on Sunday, if I need to be part of something that's going on, you guys take a back seat because of the church. It's it's these are the ways this sacrificial thing where we're putting Christ and his church above everything else when push comes to shove shows the world the love that we have for the church, the dedication we have to him, the fact that we're following him and and just giving up that that perfect mask that we talked about, giving up that comfort of saying I'm good. Somebody's got to be the first one to cross that bridge. And so uh it, it it's a hard thing to do, but we can get there, we can do it. And so we're going to have one more episode on the church reset arc. It's or it's it's not going to be based on the book. It's going to be pretty wild. Uh, actually, I, I don't know what you guys are going to say. It's going to be if you could reset one thing about the church. If there's one thing you could, if you were starting from scratch, that you would do differently. Or three things, actually. I think we're each going to give a list of three. And so next week will be very interesting. I'm, I'm very interested to see what these guys have to say. Uh, hope Joe doesn't go too far off the reservation. <laughs> but uh, I'll try to rein it in. I'll try and rein it in. Okay. Um, once again. Real fast. Yeah. Real fast. I just wanted to go over those just for because we kind of went through them. So for those that are listening that really want to put some of these into practice, talk to your church, talk to your elders, talk to your family, you know, talk to people about, obviously, your church family, but but your family, um, physical family, how you can do some of these one another commands. Encourage one another day after day, bear one another's burdens, confess to one another, tolerate one another, and forgive each other, be hospitable to one another without grumbling, and love one another. The one another commands are really what's going to get this across the line. That's what's going to help us be the church that everybody wants to see that Will talked about next to. That's how we do it. So I just wanted to sum those up again real fast because I know we, we were bouncing around a little bit. Um, study those. Talk to people about them. How are you going to get them done? I'm going to try to do the same here as well. Yeah. Don't wait for a program. Just start doing it. Start making the raspberry cheesecakes. Now, you know, if you know that that's what you're supposed to do and, and figure it out as you go. Um, okay. Uh, once again, a reminder of the Think Fast. Check out our YouTube channel. We're going to keep those coming, uh, starting with Conspiracy Theories this week. Uh, like, subscribe, leave us a review. Uh, just continue to support the work at Focus Press by word of mouth. We're so thankful. Uh, so many listeners are telling people about it, and uh, we appreciate you guys, our uh, deep thinkers, I guess, as uh, our, our listeners are called. And we will talk to you guys next week. Mm-hmm.